Continuing on with playing God. When you do enough of that, and I don't know for you what constitutes enough. When you do enough of that, you start to really see him. The heart of him. Why he wants what he wants. Why he does what he does. It's really important to do that because... I mean, what's the point of being alive if not to see him? At the same time, from an interpretational standpoint of scripture... Why are the verses that are there, there? You know, I mean, it's called the Word of God. That tells you that that has two distinct meanings, scripturally and, you know, just in English even. What he says and a contract. The whole purpose of the Bible, which isn't talked about enough and should be, is that it's a contract. It's literally a series of depositions. A deposition means, hi, I'm telling you a story of some facts, and I warrant that these are, these are true. It's deposition in the sense that it's God's deposition. It's a deposition in the sense that it's whoever the human writer is saying, yes, I really got these words from God. And the the secret there is when he's saying, I got these words from God, at sometimes he's putting it in his own words, not God's words, but God's meaning is coming out through the human's words. It's called verbal plenary inspiration. And the theological definition is basically that the person who's doing the writing is totally unobstructed. He's writing from his own nature, from his own words, and his own personality, and his own way of expression. But at the same time, God's intended meaning is coming out through that human's words. So when we say the word of God, it's a contract from God to us, each of us, each human born. A contract means hi, if this, then that. Part of a contract also includes depositions about, you know, to sort of help you understand and interpret the contractual provisions. Okay. And you can talk to any lawyer you want about that. It's called case law and sometimes. But there are other things. There's information in a contract that isn't itself contractual, but it helps to explain why the contractual provisions are there. Now, what all this does when you know it enough is you see the person behind the contract. That's why it's there. The ultimate reason why you get scripture is to know the person behind the contract because God doesn't have a body. The real you is actually immaterial as well. And you don't even know how to find your own soul. You just are that soul. And God knows how to communicate to that soul. So when you read the physical words of a physical book written by physical people, The real God who's spiritual makes that material perspicuous to you about him. So playing God helps you play out those words to learn him and see him and have an active daily relationship with him. And when you've had enough of that, it gets really intense. This is a secret of the spiritual life that nobody's talking about, but they should be. What makes it so hard is that it's so real. It's so very much with him, in him, under him. And you've got nothing on the outside you can point at to prove it. Except the Bible. I mean, you really have everything outside your life to prove it. But without the lens of Scripture... 
you can't prove a thing. This is the point of it. When you get enough scripture in your head, everything fits together. You know the person behind the contract and every word in the contract, a.k.a. the Bible, suddenly comes together very clearly, cohesively. You understand it from Genesis to Revelation. It doesn't mean you won't have questions about individual verses, but the fit of it. And when that happens, the intensity really ramps up. It's very, very difficult in the later stages of the spiritual life to breathe. I don't care if you're having a good day or a bad day. Everything in this life is too small. And everything in this life is like nails on a, fingernails on a blackboard. Because your own nature inside is totally at odds with your own soul. It's, it's, it's excruciating to exist. So what that helps you understand through the pain, through the excruciating, through the pressure, through all of it, is what it was like for Christ to be God and man in one person. It's excruciating. But it has to be. It has to be because how else is freedom going to be free, high attached to low? There's just no, there's no alternative that's worth living. So it's either pain or not worth living. In other words, you have to learn to adjust to having the pain all the time. It's a soul pain. Ishmaqovot. Thank you, Dad. Where is that? We'll do a holy. Isaiah 53 4. He was, they, I like to translate that the heartbreak man, but they usually translate it in English like acquainted with grief. Really stupid translation. He wasn't merely acquainted. Holy means devastating grief. That's what you have to learn to live with. All day, every day, all night, every night. It, I don't know how much you know about pain and suffering, but it's kind of like exercise in that you have to do it until you hate doing it. You have to do it until you can't stand it anymore. And then you got to keep on doing it past the point of not being able to stand it anymore. It's only when you've gone past your tolerance that growth occurs. It's never pleasant. It's always necessary. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. Now, the biggest thing to understand about that is then you start to really know what love is. That's the oddest thing. Love is where you kill yourself to get something. It's not about how attractive it is and what it does for you. People have a wrong definition of love in their minds. If ever somebody's always chirping, oh, I love him. What they're saying is that they're, they're attracted to. And they're saying that whoever that person is or object is of their so-called love is, is something that pleases them. They get something in their minds from it. That's not love. Love is when you give all to a thing. It's very much like addiction. That's what love is. When it isn't benefiting you, when it isn't doing anything for you, when it's killing you to go through it, and you hate going through the process, but you want to do it anyhow. The soldier sitting in a foxhole or sitting in a, in a you know, section of Fallujah with all those crappy Muslims running around being so nasty all the time. He loves his job, but he hates doing it. 
because he loves it, he keeps doing it, even though he hates doing it. That's real love. Humans don't know what that is. I mean, it's not that we don't ever have moments, but we're talking absolute here. God put, what was it? Psalm 138, two. God puts the truth above his own name. He kills, he, he, I mean, he, God can't die, okay. I can, but won't. He does everything that we would say in a colloquial expression, God kills himself. For the sake of truth. Truth be free and he'll kill himself to do it. Every minute of every day. From all eternity past to all eternity future. That's him. That's the heart of him. That's why I started this God's Deeds series in episode one. It's about truth be free. That's where this whole theme started. That's the heart of God right there. That's the future, that's the past, that's the meaning to him. That's what being God means to him. He don't want to be God without it. That's why all of this, as we would call it, you know, putting up with us, that's why he does it. It's real love. It's absolute love. He's not getting anything for it. He's not doing it to get something for it. He keeps on creating an unending cost. The cross creates an unending cost. I really wish they'd cover this in the pulpit. We always say that Christ paid for sins on the cross. He created an unending cross on the cross. Because by paying for sins, then that means we get saved. So now we're, he's stuck with us forever. Except he wants to be stuck with us forever. But we never, there's never anything... Pre or post sin, pre or post being paid for, what the hell is it's good for him that we are? Huh? That's like, you know, hi, you kill yourself so that ants can crawl over you forever. That sounds like hell to me. Does that sound like hell to you? When you have kids, you kill yourself for your kids you love them and there comes a time ideally at least once a day when you long to be away from your kids just to have a break imagine never the kids never growing up imagine never having that moment when you can get away from your kids how do you love your kids that much The last thing on earth I ever wanted was motherhood. And that's really what eternity means. Parenting. If you want to be close to God, you have to turn into a king. He turns you into that in your soul. You'll be older than them, more mature than them in your soul. And they will be forever hanging on to you. They will be forever your children. They will be forever younger than you in their soul. And it will be very difficult to have a decent conversation with them, ever. And they grow a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Every day, forever. But you're always so far ahead of them, you can't have a decent conversation. It's like difference between being very rich and being very poor. Except richness is richness of thinking. And poverty is poverty of thinking. And that's really what real wealth is. You can take all the other kinds of wealth you want to talk about. And they mean absolutely nothing compared to what goes on in the soul. If you're rich in every other way but you got a poor soul. 
Nobody's going to want to be around you except to use your goodies because being around you is a total no annoyance. But if you're wealthy inside your soul, then everybody wants to be around you whether you got anything or not. It's the craziest damn thing. But you want to be alone because they hang on you. It's very wearing. And a lot of us as Christians kind of have moments where we kind of see that. Baby Christians or atheists or agnostics that come in and, you know, bother you all the time. They ask a thousand questions and they want a thousand answers all at once in a sound bite. And if you aren't doing exactly what they want this second, well then you're you're not a good Christian. Huh? Where does it say in the Bible, thou shalt be a doormat? You know, all that stuff that Paul talks about, how you have to be careful how you behave. He's not saying it because that's being a good Christian. He's saying it because these other idiots out there are going to beat you up with their questions and their accusations. And no matter what you do, they're still going to beat you up. So you got it like for the sake, for their sake, because they're so childish and insane. You have to be nice. Not all the time. And you have to know when not to be nice. I haven't gotten that part right till yet. But if you look at how Christ talks, sometimes he's really nice. And sometimes, honey, he's really nasty. He knew when to do one or the other. But that's all parental. Sometimes you're really nice to your kids and sometimes you smack them. That's what parenting is. Mommy, 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 mommy. And sometimes you ignore the kid. And sometimes you're soothing to the kid. And sometimes you smack the kid upside the face. Which one is right? And who in his right mind will want that for an eternity? But this is the why of the integration. Why God's doing it. This is why playing God is so important. Now, there are a whole bunch of folks out there who really enjoy what I'm talking about. They enjoy the whole parenting thing. They enjoy the struggle of it. They enjoy the this and the that and the other thing. I don't understand why. I don't see anything enjoyable about it. So they can identify with this part of God's character. Obviously, I don't. You can argue all day, well, brain out. You should. Yeah, you're right. But I don't. This is how he really is. And it doesn't detract from the fact that he also is very tired of it. You can be tired and still not sin. God isn't like, you know, a plastic person. And you can hear Christ express... Oh, man, what what's going to take, you know, a lot of times he says in the Gospels, what is it going to take before you listen to me? You can be exasperated and not sin. It's exasperating to be a parent. You can hate going through something and not sin. You don't want to do it, but you do it anyway. Well, that's what really love is. So that's not sin. Does it mean it's pleasant? And does it mean that you're supposed to just, oh, I love being a doormat? No. It is not pleasant to be on a cross. It's not supposed to be pleasant. It would be untruthful to try to claim it's pleasant. It hurts. I don't want to be here. I don't like this. I want to get out. I want to go away. That's all normal and that's all truthful. And that's exactly the attitude you ought to have toward the reality, which is not nice. But just stick it out anyhow. Because you love going for the goal.
even if you don't get them. In a very real sense, the goal is never reached. It's never reached with respect to all those people in hell, which is going to become the lake of fire. Because even though they're allowed, and even though they can, they won't ever believe in him. They love shaking their fist at God. That's the only thing that they enjoy. They like being mad at him. Satan will forever be shaking his fist at God. He loves it. That's what he loves. That's what the people in hell and the eventual lake of fire love. They love hating God. And they'll, they'll sacrifice themselves for that too. So that's at the bottom end. They're, you know, they're, you know, putting the truth of their loving hatred for God above their own comfort. It's an anti Psalm 138 too. A lot of suffering. And the same is actually true in heaven too. Except that when you love what you're doing, even when it hurts, you don't call it suffering. You call it privilege. you got something you do in your life right now that, oh man, to somebody else looking at you do it, why are you giving up so much? But you don't think you're giving up a thing. Why do you sacrifice so much? Why are you so committed? I've heard that a thousand times. Maybe not a thousand, but a lot. Yeah, you're so committed to God. I don't think of myself as committed to God. Not even a little bit. Whatever it is that I believe or whatever, well, that benefits me. I consider him committed to me and I don't understand why. Even though I can say why. He loves me and I just don't get that. I can explain it. I can justify it. I can tell you all the juridical reasons, yada yada, And for all that, I don't get it. But when somebody says the same thing about me toward him, even if I have to admit, yeah, I guess it's true, because factually it is true, I don't, I, there's a part of me that doesn't get that either. See, when you love, you don't account yourself as loving. So you don't account any sacrifice you expend as actually being a sacrifice. It's only when you hate that you do. So God does not account what he does for us as a sacrifice. It is, but he doesn't account it that way. Because he doesn't want to be God without it. Now the trick is in playing God to get to that same space. To get to that same point of view. Where you're seeing through God's eyes the way he does about the same thing. And so he takes you on this kind of your life. He's going to take you on this round robin. There are going to be things where you already share his point of view. And so you get like short stints of experience with those things. Because you're already developed there. And then you get to practice it for a while. And you really enjoy your sacrificing what you don't call sacrificing and then he takes you to a place where you don't enjoy it so you do account it as sacrificing because you really don't love doing it and you just sort of stick it out and then you know he moves you in that area for a little while and then he takes you to something else and the, the, the things vary by person what is a considered a prosperity for one person is considered by somebody else as a total adversity. Some of us absolutely adore being alone and some of us can't stand it. Some of us adore not having money because we recognize that money is a problem. And some of us can't stand not having money. I mean, you know, it's all personal. Your tastes and the next person's are very different. So whatever's going against the grain for you, he'll take you there. Whatever's going, you know, in the direction you want to go anyway, he'll take you there too. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the idea is to get to the same 
throwdown attitude that he has whether you enjoy throwing yourself down or not. I saw him do that with my pastor. And that was kind of what helped me understand this the best. Early on, my pastor was very, um, when he started out, he was very much Mr. Macho Man, okay? Very smart guy. Very um, hot-tempered. Very quick. And he started to realize that God was taking him on the round robin. So he started explaining, you know, stuff in his own background to us so that we would understand it too. And I watched him go from, you know, Mr. Hot on politics and hot on macho man and hot on sports to being just whatever God wants, he wants it. A lot more quiet at the end. The awe that he started that you could just feel when you hear him talk about anything in scripture his total addiction to getting the, every little part of it right and he had absolutely no qualms whatsoever about saying that he had said something wrong in the past in fact one of the problems they had at the church was that in 1985 he wanted to throw out everything he ever taught once he started to really understand what Ephesians was about. And they, they talked him out of it, fortunately. And his ministry went in an entirely different direction. That's why I can always tell when somebody's pretending that they were under him. Because after 1985, we'll talk about a whole different ball game. The books don't reflect it. And the early classes don't reflect it. You have to listen to the guy talk from 1985 until he retired in 2003. Entirely different. Really went into the stratosphere at that point. But the, the character changed. He went from being a firebrand to just being stuck on God. Just everything was God, God, God. The man, he, he, he didn't even think about himself. It was just what God had to say. And it really drove the congregation nuts. They didn't understand what was going on. But if you were to listen to the, the guy after 1985, I mean, it started slowly at first. It took like about four or five years before it really started to kick in. If you were to listen to that versus, say, in the 1960s, you wouldn't, you, you'd kind of wonder, was well, this the same person? This is what happens to you, too. And the reason I bring him up is that the big thing with him was is he hated repetition. He hated stupidity. He had absolutely no tolerance whatsoever for people who were stupid and nasty and, and petulant and all the rest of those childish things that Christianity is. But at the end, he was willing to go to any lengths of any patience just to get even one dot understood better. And the, the pity of it is, is that the congregation pretty much abandoned him. Didn't matter. It was whatever God said in the word. He didn't care how much time it took to get the point across. He'd go over it and over it and over it. And this is a guy who 40 years prior hated repetition. Hated it. Now the reason I bring that up is that that's a documentable source that you can go to and you can pick classes from 1960s versus classes in the 1990s and see the difference in the person to understand the trajectory of the kind of change that God takes us all through in our lifestyle. He happens to be a poster boy for it and I guess to some extent it looks like I'm a lesser one too. But so are you. God has a journey he's taken us all on. And what it's supposed to do is fill you up, fill you out, fill you through. Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, filling all in all. So the person you are at the end of your life, ideally, 
is more like him. However you started, whatever you were when you got into the spiritual life, that's not who you'll end up being at the end. Who you end up being at the end is much more like the real Christ. And the real Christ is not known to Christianity. Christianity has this fakakta idea that you're supposed to be a doormat and nice, and talk nice all the time, and do good deeds in order to be a good Christian. That has abs- that, that that that's Satan's I Satan's gambit. Christ was nothing like that, because there's nothing you can do in this body that God needs or wants. The only reason you're still alive after you're saved is to learn how to think like Christ. There's not a damn thing in your body or in your life, high or low, good or bad, vis-a-vis other people that God can use. He's building you. You're the fruit, not what you do. And so Paul likens the whole thing to pregnancy. And you have to understand that in the Bible, pregnancy means not alive. doesn't count. It was Paul's biggest focus. You can talk to almost any of the scholars on this because they all kind of joke about it. Paul was obsessed with the whole pregnancy thing. Everything was about virgin pregnancy. The miracle of giving birth. It's in all of his letters. It's a running joke, whether it's, what was that? In Galatians 4.19, you know, I'm sweating you out until Christ is born in you. Or Galatians 4.4, 4, where he makes a joke about Christ being born on Hanukkah, using the Greek word chronos, which is the equivalent of the Latin, you know, Saturn. Saturnalia festival equals Hanukkah, when Christ was born, just as predicted in Haggai 2. I don't know why the scholars didn't figure that out. It's a really great joke. And then he's doing the whole pregnancy joke again. Then, what was it? Romans 8, uh, verses 1 through 10. Especially in Romans 8, 11. And then he plays the pregnancy joke again in Ephesians 3. Well, Ephesians 1 especially because he's playing off Mary. He's, he's using the end point in the Magnificat for his meter start. And, you know, that's why Luke did it. The whole, the whole of Luke's gospel is built around the Magnificat. I've done the videos on that so you can see that for yourself forensically. But the point is, is that everything Paul focused on was pregnancy, 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 pregnancy. That you, your life, down here, is a pregnancy. The whole book of Romans is pretty much dedicated to that. Especially, what was it? Verse, Romans 7, 8, and 9. 7, 8, 7, 8, and 9. 8 is all about pregnancy directly. 8, 11 in particular. The whole world being in travail. Travail is the King James translation for pregnancy. Labor. Pregnancy labor. He's playing off Isaiah fifty three eleven, which is man mal enough show and amal is the word for being pregnancy labor. It was used for the rape of Tamar. That verb. Paul's playing on it. All of his letters do. So your life is to go through the pregnancy of Christ being born in you, Galatians four nineteen. Galatians four nineteen. I'm sweating you out until Christ is born in you. And, as you might guess, pregnancy means that in the beginning it's just a little bit. And at the end, you're, you know, your belly's really big, so to speak. And it's really hard to walk around. It's really hard to move. Everything's painful and upsetting or just a big burden. And you really wish to die. Get it over with. But you have to wait. Now, at that end, everything pretty much about your life is miserable, even when it's nice on the surface. It's really important to stress. You can have everything that all humans consider good and nice and pleasant and right. 
and you won't be happy with it because it's too small. All it does is add to the irritation. It looks very much like the same thing when a person is totally apostate spiritually. A person is totally apostate spiritually, they can't enjoy life, period. No matter what you have, no matter what you like, you can't enjoy it. When you're spiritually mature, it has that same edge to it. Because the whole, the whole goal is to get to think like Christ, so it's high attached to low. So that no matter how miserable you are, you're happy. And no matter how happy you are, you're miserable. The difference with the apostate person is that no matter what they have, they're miserable. Because what they don't have is they don't have knowing God. But knowing God is not a pleasant experience. See, God wants to be God to throw himself down and kill himself. So it's not pleasant. You don't want to be God without it. You don't want to be alive if you can't know him. But it isn't pleasant to know him. This is real love. It isn't an unmitigated pain. It isn't an unmitigated pressure. But pretty much as far as, you know, your daily life goes, it's it's a slog. And you don't want to live without it. Now once you're dead, all that slog produces a soul which is much more like him because that's what the Holy Spirit's building and it gets born at death. And if the whole construct the, it's like, you know, pathways or think of a map with all the roads built. If that structure got finished now you can travel on the roads. Only you'll be a king and you got the birthing of your subjects in your kingdom constantly going, Mommy, 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 Daddy, 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 Daddy. And you'll love it. And this is a way to share, to be inside him the way he's in you forever. It's not really pleasant, and yet you don't want to live without it. See, sin is only part of the problem. The sin part of the problem is removed when we're dead. But the shortfall is never removed. Shortfall. You're an adult, and those are your kids. The kids are always needy. They're always short. There's always this huge gap between what you can, as it were, experience, talk about, relate to as an adult, and your children. It's always a hassle to be a parent. Because of that, there's this huge gap in appreciation and understanding and communication and all the stuff that you're doing you're spending 90% of your day doing something for your kids and 10% hopefully at the end of the day at least you can rest a little bit and be with an adult and then you get up in the morning and do it all again that's eternity so if you don't love being a parent you're in deep doo doo now Having said that, you do have, obviously, the option to say, Oh, man, this doesn't sound good, brain out. I think I'll just be a kid forever. Yeah, you can do that. But then you really won't know God. That's a trade-off, really. I, I can choose to just drop this spiritual life right now, and honey, I am so tempted. 
Because I hate this. I really do. And I can turn into a little baby by the time I'm dead. If I, you know, say goodbye, God, I'll see you in eternity. Because I really hate all this thing now that I know what it means. And then I'll be like this whole daddy, daddy, daddy. Forever. Go back to Egypt then. And that's, of course, a choice that you have. And most people, you know, everybody really has it. And most of them are going to die that way. I, uh, I don't want to know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe that Krishna is God. Or I'm going to go become a Muslim or I'll be an atheist or something. And I'm going to die just like this. I'm saved. And I don't even know that or appreciate it. But once I'm dead, I'll, I'll be like this. For the rest of eternity. I got that option too. And maybe I'll end up that way. I can't guarantee how I'm going to turn out. But then I won't know him. Or uh, the way I'll know him is just like I did. Hi, Dad. Oh, you're God. Oh, goody, goody. God, I'll see. We'll have a parade. And I'll see you at a distance every thousand years. I'll see your fingertips waving at a walkabout. I don't want that as my future. But I sure as hell don't want to be a parent. That's the way it is. That's why playing God is so important. How do you learn to love like that? Practice. How do you learn to be good at basketball? Or ballet? Or a piano? racquetball or even driving a car practice over and over and over and over and honey practice is not pleasant but if you really want that goal then you'll do whatever it takes here the goal is to be one with him in your soul going through the parenting thing in him and with him and under him because they're going to be his kids. And you want to be with him in it. No longer as mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy. Oh, see, Jesus loves me. This I know. That's an option you got. You can have that kind of relationship to him. Or you can grow up in it. You grow up in it, you are closer to him. You get closer to him and you grow up in it, the more difficult it is just to breathe. Until it's excruciating because it's your own cross. That's what playing God leads to. That's what it's supposed to lead to. So then you ask yourself a question. Okay, now I know the integrated why is a sort of like overview picture. Is this really what I want? Now, maybe you don't. That's what you got to decide between God and you. Do you really want to keep growing in the spiritual life? I mean, once you believe that Jesus Christ paid for your sins, you can't lose your salvation. But maybe that's all you want. Because there's a whole lot of pleasure in being two years old forever. Oh, Ruth. Yeah. Decide where you want your pleasure to be. Because, honey, there's no point in being religious. It's only about how close do you want to be to God to know Him. And the only way you can get there is to play Him. Like you'd play a piano. Or play racquetball. Or play basketball. You play God. Think about it. 